Greetings for another week, you good bears. Hey, we're just about on the home stretch, aren't we? And what a ride this semester has been. As Brother Bircham had said, you'll be talking about this to your grandchildren about this year, 2020, and what happened. Well, we saw how London used naturalism, and we saw how Anderson was our first writer under modernism, but he also had a little carryover from naturalism, if you'll remember. And today we're going to look at two more writers under modernism, James Thurber and Stephen Benson Benet. But before we go there, let's pause for a word of prayer. God, we praise you for your holiness, your goodness, and your kindness. Being separated, we've grown to appreciate each other more, which has been sort of a hard lesson to learn as we experienced isolation. But we thank you for keeping us safe. And please continue to bless us. Without you, we are truly nothing. Help us to be more merciful and to be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, here's some information on James Thurber. And this is also on a PowerPoint in the Google Classroom. James Thurber grew up in Columbus, Ohio graduated with honors from high school in 1913, and went to Ohio State University. But he did not get a degree there. He then moved to New York City in 1926 and met E.B. White in 1927. White was one of the editors for the, the uh, magazine called The New Yorker. And so he hired um, Thurber as an editor, writer, and cartoonist. He wrote four books in the 1930s that brought success, so he began writing as a freelance author and did some traveling as well. An accident in his childhood caused serious damage to one eye, and he had other serious eye problems which required operations in 1940, and despite those, his sight continued to wor worsen. So in 1951, he drew his last cartoon. But that did not stop his writing. He published 14 more books after those operations. He would revise a story up to 25 times to get it just right. Now that's dedication. <laughs> his Secret Life of Walter Mitty is regarded as one of the best of America. His 20 years of cartoons included seals and sea lions, Strange Tigers, Spineless Men, Determined Women, and most of all, Dogs, which were very, very popular. He helped to co-author a successful play. One marriage ended in divorce, but his second marriage was successful. He died from pneumonia in 1961. There's an award named after him for someone who makes an outstanding example of American humor. In the first couple of pages, it sounds like Mr. Martin is going to do what to Ms. Barrows? This is, this is from, from the story, The Catbird Seat. How does sitting in the, what does sitting in the catbird seat mean, and how does this serve as a foreshadowing? The idea began to blossom, strange and wonderful. What was this idea, and how did Mr. Martin carry it out? Now let's talk about this story, which I hope you have read. In the first couple of pages, it sounds like Mr. Erwin Martin is going to murder Mrs. Uh, Eugene Barrows. Thurber uses the term rub out, which uh, he also applies to erasing a mistake. What does being in the catbird seat mean? Well, it means that you are sitting pretty, like a batter with three balls and no strikes. This is some foreshadowing, as we shall see uh, when we get to the conclusion of the story. What did Mr. Martin do when he came home? That's right, he replayed the tapes in his mind of what had happened in the office where he worked the previous week. Mrs. Barrows had been hired as a special advisor to the boss of FNS, the company, and the boss, Mr. Fitzwiler, who had met Ms. Barrows at a party, thought she would make a good employee to keep things running smoothly in the office. Mr. Martin was not very impressed the minute that he saw her. She was rather loud, used crazy sentences like, are you lifting the ox cart out of the ditch? 
And despite her annoying ways, Mr. Martin had kept his cool and demonstrated a polite tolerance of her. However, one day she entered into his office and asked if he needed all his filing cabinets. He replied that he did, but when she left, Martin knew that Mrs. Barrows was about to bring down her pickaxe on his department and some changes were going to have to be made. So Mr. Martin knew that he had to act quickly. Since Mr. Martin neither drinks nor smokes, it is unusual that we see him buying a package of cigarettes as the story begins. Now the narrator lets us know that if anybody was to see Mr. Martin, that his whole plan would need to be abandoned. But he makes it into her apartment and is very nervous. She offers him a drink and he looks around for a weapon while she's in the kitchen. Then she told him to take off his gloves and come sit by her, which he does. Then he takes a puff and a drink. She remarks how perfectly marvelous it is to see him doing these things. He replies that he drinks and smokes all the time. This is kind of when that idea begins to form in his mind. Then he clanged his glass against hers and said, here's nuts to that old windbag, Mr. Fitzwaller. After being somewhat shocked at his remark, Mr. Martin continued that he has prepared a bomb to blow up his boss. So she asked Mr. Martin if he was on drugs, and he said heroin, and that he'd be tickled when he knocked off the old buzzard. Ms. Burroughs is now on her feet shouting, Mr. Martin, that will be all of that. You must go at once. So Mr. Martin goes to get his coat, and then he puts uh, on his hat, and then he puts his fingers to his lips, saying, not a word about this to anyone. Then he said, I'm sitting in the catbird seat. And he stuck out his tongue at her and left. At work the next morning, Ms. Burroughs says that she is going to report Mr. Martin to the boss immediately. Mr. Martin looks surprised and says, I beg your pardon? After about 45 minutes, Ms. Burroughs leaves the boss's office. And about 30 minutes later, Mr. Fitzwiler calls for Mr. Martin. He asks Martin if he has worked for the company 20 years, and Martin replies, 22. And he's never drank or smoked. Correct, sir, replied Martin. Then the boss asks what Martin did the previous night. Martin replies that he followed his usual routine and went to bed early. Then he told Martin that Ms. Burroughs had been working too hard, and that she had been suffering a nervous breakdown with distressing hallucinations. She's under the delusion that you visited her last night and behaved very inappropriately. But that's exactly what happens when there's a breakdown. The victim blames someone else for their problems. Mr. Fitzwaller also continued that he had consulted a psychiatrist who had sort of confirmed his suspicions. He also mentioned that Ms. Barrows was going to restructure the filing department uh, subject to his approval, but that that now would not be necessary. Her usefulness had come to an end. I'm dreadfully sorry, said Mr. Martin. Then Ms. Barrow suddenly enters the office and begins to replay the whole evening again, begging the boss to reconsider and to see the game that Mr. Martin was playing. But her pleas fell on deaf ears, and the boss got several of the other personnel to take the screaming Ms. Barrow's home. Then the boss tells Mr. Martin to forget the whole incident, and Martin says he will. Then he walks light and quickly back to his department, but when he enters, he slows down his pace and has a studious look of concentration on his face. So we see that Mr. Martin really is in the catbird seat because he still has his job doing it the way he's always done it, and Ms. Barrels isn't there anymore to bother him. Well, when someone can keep us laughing, they can usually make pretty good money. Now here are a few more questions to consider. What elements make this story humorous? Does there continue to be a battle of the sexes? And explain what elements in the story make Mr. Martin appear to be heroic. We can talk about those questions during our Zoom meeting later today at two o'clock. Okay, now let's go to our next author, Stephen Vincent Benet. Benet was born in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, had a father who was a colonel and a lover of reading especially poetry. Thus, William, Laura, and Stephen all became writers. Hey, you know what? There's often a little pattern here I've discovered in American literature. Those writers whose parents read to them 
regularly were the ones that instill with them a love for reading and writing. So, word of the wise, if you want your children to become good writers, good students, take some time, turn off the TV, turn off the computer, and read to them. Yeah. Benet published his first book of poetry at age 17. Yes, it can happen. Someone at 17 publishing a book of poetry. And then he attended Yale. He published another book of poetry by the time he graduated in 1919, and he wrote a third book instead of writing a master's thesis in 1920. He produced his first novel when he was 23, and he also married that year. Short stories brought more money, but poetry was his strongest genre. He also wrote screenplays and radio broadcasts. Winning an Academic Cash Award, Binet concentrated on writing a long narrative poem about the Civil War called John Brown's Body in 1928. And this work was awarded a Pulitzer Prize in 1929. As the textbook noted, his most famous work, The Devil and Daniel Webster, was written in 1937, and it has been made into a play, a movie, an opera, and a TV program. So you can see how popular it is. He died of a heart attack at the age of 45 after having suffered 13 years with spinal difficulties, arthritis of the spine. At the time of his death, he had a work of five volumes planned, another poetic narrative about all of American history, and he completed one volume and it received a Pulitzer Prize in 1943. He published 17 volumes, all totaled in his short life. So, Take a look at The Devil and Daniel Webster. Here's just a little sample. But till you make a bargain like that, you've got no idea of how fast four years can run. By the last months of those years, Jabez Stones, known all over the state, and there's talk of him running for governor, and it's dust and ashes in his mouth. For every day when he gets up, he thinks, there's one more night gone. Every night when he lies down, he thinks of the black pocketbook and of the soul of Miser Stevens, and it makes him sick at heart. Till finally he can't bear it any longer. And in the last days of the last year, he hitches his horse and drives off to seek Daniel Webster. For Daniel was born in New Hampshire, only a few miles from Cross Corners, and it's well known that he had a particular soft spot for old neighbors. It was early in the morning when he got to Marshfield, but Daniel was up already talking Latin to the farmhands and wrestling with the ram Goliath and trying out a new trotter and working up speeches to make against John C. Calhoun. But when he heard a New Hampshire man had come to see him, he dropped everything else he was doing, for that was Daniel's way. He gave Jabez, Jabez Stone a breakfast that five men couldn't eat went into the living history of every man and woman in cross corners, and finally asked him how he could serve him. Jabez Stone allowed that it was kind of a, a mortgage case. Well, I haven't pleaded a mortgage case in a long time, and I don't generally plead now except for the Supreme Court, said Daniel. But if I can, I'll, I'll help you. Then I've got hope for the first time in 10 years, said Jabez Stone, and he told him the details. Daniel walked up and down as he listened, hands behind his back, now and then asking a question, and now and then plunging his eyes to the floor, as if they bore through it like gimlets. Then Jabez Stone had finished. Daniel puffed out his cheeks and blew. Then he turned to Jabez Stone, and a smile broke over his face like the sunrise over Manonok. You've certainly given yourself the devil's own road to hoe, neighbor Stone, he said, but I'll take your case. You'll take it, said Jabez Stone, hardly daring to believe. Yes, said Daniel Webster. I've got about 75 other things to do in the Missouri Compromise to straighten out, but I'll take your case. For if two New Hampshire men aren't a match for the devil, we might as well give this country back to the Indians. Well, here's some questions that you can be thinking about as you read. How can you tell that this will be a tall tale? What techniques does Bennett use that are similar to what Irving used? Remember way back there, the devil and Tom Walker? See if you can see some similarities here. 
How did Bennett create his humor? Well, you've been a great audience today. Thanks for all the good attention. And I look forward to seeing your smiling faces in our Zoom meeting later on. So until our next class, may God bless you and may he protect you.